Okay, we're starting static electricity and I'm so excited. One thing you're gonna notice as we go through this unit is there's always gonna be some textbook pages with it. And that's just so you have some extra practice or another way to read through it if you're interested in it. Unless they're specifically assigned, you don't have to read through the textbook, but they're there for you to use as extra help. So they will be all linked in together. So first of all, you guys already know what electricity is. You should know what static electricity is probably more than anything else because you see it and you experience it in your house. So one of the ways that you do that is that you have it when, like for me, I have it when I come in from outside and it's cold and my hair is stuck to literally anything. Like I just walk around and my hair is like whoosh, just because static electricity loves my hair. I am the perfect hair example for like a Van de Graaff generator and you get that whoosh on the outside. Perfect example. Um, you also get it when you rub your feet on a carpet and then you touch a doorknob and there's a spark. You can also see it in lightning. There are tons of examples of static electricity all around us. So how is static electricity made? Well, we got to go back a little bit to our chemistry unit where we talked about what's inside our atoms. So we know that we have protons, neutrons, and electrons. Now this static electricity is from a charge and that charge is going to be electrons being pulled off of their atom or being moved through a wire so that the charge is present, the charge is moving. Now, very, very important that it's exactly the same as chemistry in that we never move the protons. The positive charge does not move. Now, if you have an electrician in your family, they will tell you that I am wrong because electricians still use it as the positive moving, but scientists use it as the negative moving and have the whole time. So for us, the negatives can move. And we know that that's true because the negatives can be pulled off of the atom, whereas the positives always stay put, okay? So depending on whether an object is charged or not will depend on whether it has extra electrons or too few electrons, exactly like our ions when we had positive and negative ions. <gasps> We're reusing our knowledge, it's so exciting. So if you look down here, um, down in this section down here. You've got neutral because you have the exact same number of positives as negatives. This one is positively charged because you have more positives than negatives. And over here, we're negatively charged because we have more negatives than positives. So protons and neutrons stuck in the nucleus. We talked about this before. The electrons are allowed to move an orbit outside that nucleus, which is why they're allowed to be pulled off and used. So now that we know that we can have objects be positively charged or negatively charged, we need to know how they're going to interact. So if you have a positive and a positive, they're going to whoosh, go as far away from each other as possible. They don't want to be near each other. They repel each other. If you have a positive and a negative, whoosh, they stick together. They love each other. This is where, this is literally, it is science that gave us the opposites attract phrase because it is literally the positive charge and the negative charge that goes whoosh, and that is where we get the phrase opposites attract. Now, if you have a neutral object, what will happen is your neutral object, the positives can't move. So they will stay exactly where they are. But if this object is negative, all the negatives inside of here will move to this side. So they'll all be on like my hand part. And so the side that's open by my fingers will look positive and they'll still be attracted. So it's very important that you understand that neutral objects can be attracted because within that object, things can be positive and negative because the electrons will move either towards a positive charge or away from a positive charge. Now we're gonna be doing a simulation on this this week and that will help clarify that for you. But basically it just means that if you have a positive charge, the negatives are gonna to move towards it. And if you have a negative charge, the electrons inside like your wall will move away from it. 
Hopefully that makes sense. If it didn't make sense, watch this video. So there are videos embedded in this as we go through. Please watch them. Make sure you know what's happening. It's going to help your understanding. So where do we see static electricity happening? We already talked about this. My hair, although this kid is way cuter than me. Lightning, sparking when you go and put something from, especially in the winter on a carpet, so you guys could practice this at home and try to shock not your siblings, but other people. No, not other people. That's not what I meant to say. Don't shock other people. Shock the door handles. Two reasons. One, it works better than shocking other people. And two, your parents don't have to get upset. I would have to do that to my kids. So, and you can also have like the balloon stick to the wall. So over here, you can see that you'd have your electrons. The positives wouldn't move. There would be positives equally distributed throughout here and the negatives could move back. Do the simulation, it will make perfect sense. Okay, so again, another video, watch it. It's amazing. You'll see what we can do. Also could help you with your at-home lab. Um, how do things get charged? Well, there's lots of different ways. They can be charged by friction, induction, and conduction. So in grade physics 30, we get into how all of those work very specifically. For you in grade nine, we really only care that you understand that if they touch, they can get charged. You can rub an object and that will get it charged. There's another fancy way that's induction that we don't actually use very much in grade nine at all, but there's one other way that it can get charged. So conduction, touching, um, friction, which would be rubbing it, and then the one where it's being brought close but they don't actually touch, it's fancy, is induction. So how do we decide how we can move charges? So the movement of charges starts bringing us into taking static electricity from the air, from our lightning, and actually going, hey, you know what? I think we could make something with a circuit out of this stuff. So we have to know how we can trap it and have it move in ways so that we can use it. So when we've got this, um, different things, you already know that you're going to have conductors like your wire is going to be a conductor because you can have a current run through a wire. You see this in your houses. You see this when you plug something in, it's a wire. There's a metal end on it on the prong. That's important because that's a conductor and will allow the electricity to flow. Insulators on the other hand are when you don't want electricity to flow. That doesn't mean that you can't charge it. So for example, your balloon, is an insulator. You can charge the balloon, but the charge will stay on that one spot on the balloon. It doesn't move all the way around. That's important because then we can see static electricity occurring because we can use just that one section of the balloon. So our insulators are mostly non-metals. Now, how can you tell if it's a good conductor or a good insulator? There's a big scale. It kind of goes from a perfect insulator to a perfect conductor. Perfect conductors are called superconductors, and I'm sure you've heard of those before. There's a little chart here, it's from the textbook. It shows you good conductors and insulators, and then there's a middle ground. This middle ground is where you kind of have some of our semiconductors fit in there, and then just not as good of a conductor but not really an insulator fits in there. Fair conductors is not a type that scientists use. They use semiconductors, but on this list, the reason why they put fair is because they included just poor conductors or poor insulators, but they're not actually quite at the semiconductor rate. So if you don't know what a semiconductor is, a semiconductor has a higher conductivity than insulators, but lower than our good conductors, like our metals. So lots of times our semiconductors are mixes of material that change the conductivity. We use these a lot in electronics, which is why they're important. Oh, our superconductors on the other hand are perfect conductors. There's no resistance to the charge. We also use these in our electronics. Very important. So I kind of made just a little scale for you. You're going to have to look at this when my face isn't in the way, but it kind of goes from the perfect insulator up to a perfect conductor. So you can kind of see the difference between those. Here's another video on static electricity. Make sure that you kind of got it stuck into your head. 
Once you've got a static charge, you need to find a ground. This is really important. Finding a ground or is returning to normal after you've built up a shock. So when you walk on your carpet and you rub your feet, and especially if you're wearing wolf socks, and you rub your feet back and forth on the carpet and then you go up to the doorknob and you chink, touch it and there's that spark, that is you allowing the extra electrons that you have gained in your body to transfer to the metal of the doorknob and go into the ground. Electrons always want to go to the ground and the earth is the biggest grounding um, situation that we have. Now, you can ground it with other devices. Using you as a ground isn't always the best thing as you will see in the video that I did where I was doing the experiment. You're gonna hear me go ow, ow, ow a lot because I'm actually getting shocked through the Van der Graaff generator because the electrons are wanting to go to the ground. And there I was holding, of course, very smart of me, I'm holding a conductor. So it's being conducted from the Van der Graaff into the conductor and then down through my body into the ground. The Van der, our Van der Graaff generator isn't that strong. It can give you a pretty good shock, but it's not gonna hurt me um, for any long period of time. So electrons are always trying to get to the ground. They always need to have that discharge. That is what lightning is as well. So super important that you understand what they are, that you can jump a gap and that that's where it's coming from. So grounding is making contact with the earth. We have systems put into place to cause this grounding to happen. You have lightning rods, we have grounds put onto batteries or when you're charging another car up that you need to ha have a ground there and that's so there's a way for the electri excess electricity to get out so that it doesn't go through humans, it doesn't go through our houses, it doesn't wreck our electronics. Those are all really important things. Now, we're ending with Bill Nye. I love Bill. You probably love Bill. If you don't want to watch him, that's okay, but please make sure you go do your labs, do the simulations, do labs at home, rub your feet with wool socks on on the carpet, and see if you can get a shock on the doorknob. See you next week.